Adam said one minute, Robin, and now it's a thumbs up. Yay! Don't worry, I'm not the official MC or anything. Um, so this is just me saying, hi, hello, welcome. I have in the script to tell you to please be seated, but you've already nailed that. So well done. Um, we are about to begin. I'm Robin. I work at Accessible Arts. I helped organize this event. Um, Accessible Arts is the peak arts and disability organization in New South Wales, and we love that you are here and we love the MCA for letting us host here. Thank you so much to the MCA. I would like now to warmly welcome Daniel McDonald to commence our event with a welcome to country. Hello. My name is Daniel McDonald, and my mob are from the Wanarua land, and my pronouns are he, him. I am on the advisory panel of the, for the disability of the Sydney City Council, and I'm also on the First Nations Disability Network panel. And I'd also like to welcome you all here to Gadigal Land. I'm welcome here to Gadigal Country here at Circular Quay. And it's the Gadigal people of the Eora. I'd like to pay my respects for Elders past and present. I would like to pay my respects to all any Aboriginal people and also any Torres Strait Islanders here today as well. It doesn't matter if you're Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, we're all brothers and sisters here today. It is the 27th of April and we're here at the MCA. We're here for Accessible Arts, inclusive and insights. Gadigal land where we stand here today stands another us. We are a confident, proud, all-inclusive community. I'd like to also acknowledge the people who have forwards and part of the way for the freedoms that we enjoy today. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you don't know each other. We need to respect one another. The time is now we've come together. We need to listen to one another. We need to focus on art inclusion. So people with disabilities can reach their potential. We need to remember to have hope, to have hope and to listen and to hear each other and have respect for each other. I have a special guest here today and I'd like to say hello to the special guest here today and thank you and have a great day. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was gorgeous. Okay, now I'm going to do an announcement about Slido. So Slido is an app. For those of you at home watching online, because this is a hybrid event, um, you are able to submit questions via Slido. It should just be on the right-hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can submit spoken questions or questions in Auslan by messaging them to the Accessible Arts Facebook page. That was just a little online notification because this event is completely hybrid. Isn't that cool? People are watching from home. Now, for those of you in the room, if you were really keen to also use Slido, 
you can. You can go on your little phone if you're thinking of a question in your head while the panel are talking and you're like, oh, I really want to hear this question at the end. You can go to slido.com on your phone and enter the code A arts so it's just arts with two a's and it's all capital if you want to now please do bear in mind we have a lot of you here we have a lot of you watching at home we might not get to all of your questions but other people in the audience can upvote their favorite questions and then jill our wonderful mc who i will introduce properly in a minute will be able to see all of your questions on her ipad so that's really cool now, I would like to give a massive welcome to our MC for today, Jill Nichol. I was so thrilled when Jill agreed to MC as the Director of Audience Engagement here at the MCA. She's well-versed in access and inclusion, and not just that, she is a warm, welcoming, lovely public speaker. Please give a huge round of applause for Jill and our panel. Thank you, Robin. I do think Robin would have made a much better MC than me. She is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to the MCA and to everyone. I think there's over 100 people uh, online as well. So it's brilliant to have you all here across the next hour. Daniel, what a beautiful welcome to country. Thank you so much. I too would like to pay, acknowledge the traditional uh, owners of the lands and waters that we meet upon today, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land, particularly where the MCA is situated. So I'm really thrilled to be here to host, to MC this event about accessible tech. I've uh, worked for over 30 years with contemporary art and uh, audiences. Um, I've, I've been here at the MCA for nearly eight years as Director of Audience Engagement, and uh, my whole life has been spent really making contemporary art accessible for as many people as possible. So um, just really glad to be here uh, with everyone who also shares that passion, especially the panel. So I'll introduce them. So. This is Stuart Buchanan, um, Sophie uh, Pengathman Young. Hope I've said that correctly. Very good. Uh -huh, we didn't <laughs> practice that. And Marcus Wright. So Stuart is a cultural programmer, music curator, and digital producer. He works as the head of digital programming at Sydney Opera House. But I mean, a big job. <laughs> and Sophie is an artist, a digital producer, and the manager for digital culture initiatives at the Australia Council for the Arts. Okay, also really big jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, Marcus is the di a digital producer here at the MCA. Marcus is a cultural practitioner and a DIA member of uh, everyone's team here at the MCA. He's also knowledge holder and he'll continue to um, develop the MCA's reach into the digital realm in the future. All right, so over the next hour or so, we'll get to know the panel a bit more, how they deal with accessible tech in their day to day. Uh, we'll hear about what changed for them during the pandem pan pandemic, pandemic. <laughs> and how they adapted to better include an audience watching from home, as did most of the world. I know. Feels like sort of ages ago, but not, right? COVID really changed years and time. It's very, very surreal. All right, so uh, we're going to try and keep it as informal as possible. I want to be interrupted. Maybe not so much by you, because we need microphones for that, but certainly from this wonderful panel. It must just be, yeah, let's just make it as informal as we can, like kind of conversation. All right, so I'd like to open with a question for everyone. So we'll see who wants to start. Um, okay, so you're all listed as digital producers. Uh, and what are some of the easy access adjustments that you often find organisations are missing? Maybe some of the quick fixes or small changes that would instantly make things more accessible. Anyone want to answer that? Warming up? Um, I look to my left. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there are a lot of quick fixes, but I think the first thing that you need to do, and especially for small to medium arts organisations, is to acknowledge that it is iterative and that you don't need to fix everything at once and start by just doing like, for instance, a really basic accessibility assessment of your website. It is better if you go through somebody like Accessible Arts, you can do an AI power. It is not that expensive. Um, 
And that is just a good way to get like a to-do list. And the other couple of things I'd say is captioning your videos. Mm. Uh, that is also generational. Younger people watch all videos with captioning. So like with most of accessibility, it's just gonna make it more accessible for everybody. Um, and also there are websites where you can put your design assets in and it will show you if your color palette is accessible and it's free and you just upload it and it says maybe change your green slightly and <laughs> those are like very they're really basic but i think they can make a huge difference yeah i think i think just testing your website as well with with communities and getting feedback and all of that and i think um test it with a screen reader as well like does it come across for you know people that use screen readers um what's a screen reader so it's like it's, it's uh, like a, a thing, an app you can have on your computer or your phone that will actually read out the text on a website to okay. you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. yeah, just seeing if your website is compatible with that, and if your images have you know alt text to them as well. If if your image can have text read out through a screen reader as well. Yeah. And uh, jumping off what Sophie was saying, that certainly that sort of um, iterative process. If you if you sort of think about. Um, all of us producing digital work, whether that's that's video or audio, the works that we're producing today, we have a particular approach to making that work accessible. Mm. But perhaps the works we produced five years ago or ten years ago um, weren't necessarily privy to that to that or, or part of that process. So part of the kind of easy quick fixes is to, is to look at the sort of um, you know digital assets that are performing really well. Mm -hmm. What's um, you know which which videos are, are, are people watching and and ensure that those are as up to date as your most recent work. We find when we look at a lot of the videos that are watched on Opera House channels, people are as much interested as the thing we did yesterday as the thing we did 10 years ago. So it's mm. it's sort of looking at your whole catalogue and, and inventory, um, you know, as much as you can in the time that you mm. have, but looking at what's most popular and ensuring that that's just as, as accessible as the most recent work you're doing. Yeah, it's keeping up. It's keeping up with everything, isn't it? I think that's the challenge because things change. Is there anywhere you can go where there's, you know, a a, a cheat sheet. Well, um, accessible arts. Accessible arts. <laughs> do you have a cheat sheet? Uh, I think depending on what state you're in, your state will have a body that looks at art and accessibility. So contacting them, going on their website, there are a lot of free resources. There are like web accessibility standards that are worldwide, and you can just Google web accessibility standards, and hopefully their SEO means that the real ones will be in the top three. <laughs> yeah. um, but I really encourage organizations to run it like a hackathon. Just set aside a day, get a bunch of different people in the room, yeah. and then just all go through it together because often it can really fall to like one person to be their job and it shouldn't it should be all of us working together to make our organizations more accessible digitally mm -hmm. if you have more people in the room you will get you will get opinions that you wouldn't have got otherwise that will be really worthwhile yeah. brilliant thank you fantastic answers <laughs> All right, so I'll go to um, some more specific things now with uh, each of our panel. So who am I starting with? Oh, Sophie, I'd like to start with you. <laughs> so um, what's this about birth plan? Um, can you tell <laughs> our audience today a little bit about your live stream performance? Uh, yes. So um, <laughs> this is such a funny first question. Um, <laughs> Let's go straight to it. Yeah. Uh, so I am pregnant. <laughs> I know no one wanted to bring it up, but I'm uh, quite pregnant. Um, so Performance Space, which is an experimental performance company that run a festival in Sydney called Liveworks, do these um, kind of in-development nights called Live Dreams. And they are great. And I would really encourage... Uh, programmers to go and check them out, but also artists to apply for them because they are both on stage and live streamed. And it's a way that you can experiment with a new idea and have video documentation and um, just really sort of connect with audiences and see how it runs. So a few years ago, I did this with a performance lecture on loading screens that ended up being an entirely live streamed performance that was programmed by another festival. Um, and this year, they run them in themes, and they had a theme called births. And I thought to myself, well, <laughs> there is never going to be a better time for this. Uh, so I am doing a 
performance lecture of my birth plan. Excellent. Of my actual birth plan, which will be activated actually in four weeks. So it's good that this is before then. Um, but yes, it's like a multimedia performative birth plan experience. Brilliant. But me can join, it may happen. Oh, it could. Very, I could very well go into labor. That's the fun of it, truly. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you for sharing that personal insight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, next question. What are some of the access learnings you've gained from your experience as a digital producer and an artist? And there's a second part to this question. What do you need to keep in mind for people watching both in real life and online? Um, as a digital producer, work with your artists on digital access early because once you kind of start that conversation, you will be amazed how often they're really excited by it and how they want to include it as part of the work. Whether it is captioning or Auslan, the earlier you have that conversation and the more you encourage them to embed it in the work, I think often the more successful it is and the more rewarding a viewing experience it can be for the viewers at home. Um, and I think it also encourages a really lovely discourse around how we work with other people and how we work collaboratively and how we work with our audiences to make things that feel good for everybody to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and as an artist, I think ask the questions early because often there will be a lot of decisions made without you and um, and you may you may want to be in that chat. It mm. may you know often performances only have like Auslan for one night, and you may want to have a conversation about what night that is and kind of understand the reasoning. I think that it's really important to not only advocate for yourself as an artist but advocate for the audiences that you want for your work. And ask about outreach. Ask if you can do any outreach as an artist, because that really matters as well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think just to say, you know, here at the MCA, when we, you know, include, we often show artists' video works and really need them to be captioned. And there's a challenge there around, you know, the purity of the object, the screen itself, and then yeah. captioning on it. So I think having those, I mean, Marcus nodding, it's, it's a, a lot of artists really love that we do that because yeah. it makes their work more accessible. Mm. They get excited, but sometimes it's really challenging because it's, and yeah, so it's about us having the conversation earlier. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you know, you'll tell an artist, oh, there'll be an Auslan and audio description and they go, oh yeah, that's, yeah. that's awesome. We want to yeah. help put input into that as well. But then there's that next challenge of how do we you know, caption a video work that is being, like, you know, displayed yeah. in the place and not have the captions there. So, you know, we'll have to maybe set up some microsite for the captions to be, and then they have to be synced perfectly. Yeah. And then, you know, there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of ways to do it, but there are a lot yeah. of issues that come from it as yeah. well and, and so, to jump through. Yeah, and there's alternative ways for, to make it completely accessible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but getting in there early is a main point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I'd love to hear more about what the Australia Council for the Arts is doing in terms of digital programs. I've heard about the Digital Strategist in Residence program and the Digital Fellowship program. Yes, uh, that is a great question. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so we run a program called the Digital Strategist in Residence program, though it is uh, how it has recently gone uh, through a program redesign and it is now called the Digital Specialist in Residence Program. Can has a real government energy there. Um, <laughs> and it runs for slightly longer and we embed a digital specialist with an organisation and um, they go through an assessment phase in the new program. They will go through an ideation phase and a piloting phase to pilot a new idea. Um, in the older program model, uh, we would the endpoint would be a digital strategy. 
Um, we are also running a number of programs kind of looking at entrepreneurship in the digital space. Yeah. So kind of in accelerator programs models. Those are really great because it allows people who are just making in real time to engage with systems of creating like organizations that they wouldn't normally get to. And we have like a great model at the moment that's coming out of Canberra from somebody that is a part of one of our projects where she, she really wanted to learn a lot of new skills and kind of have access to this digital world and realized that um, there was nowhere where she could find them kind of locally. Mm. And then the more she dug, she, she, she did, she found them locally, but there was no kind of database. And so she's like, well, how could I make a database? And so we've kind of put her in this accelerator program. She has access to all these technologists, there's seed funding to be able to develop what that idea could be. And I think that's a really exciting model because so many of our makers yeah. are making things and they are like entrepreneurial in spirit, but they, there's no place for that. So we're trying to create more places for that so that people have support and not just making an isolation. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then we have so many other programs. <laughs> I, will put, I will put a website, otherwise like, we have eight. Like I'll be talking here all day. I'll take up all the air in the room. But I think those are the two yeah. Those are the two big ones. And the digital fellowship, which is for like uh, emerging digital artists. So uh -huh. they go through a mentorship program over a year. And that one's really incredible. It centers First Nations sort of methodology. And we run it with uh, Creative New Zealand. And again, but again, if I keep talking, we'll just, <laughs> we'll just never end. <laughs> Oh yeah, and Stu is a part of one of our yeah, programs. I can talk, I can talk to that. Yeah, Stu, talk you to your program. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was invited to be part of the program, the CEO Digital Mentoring Program, which was, um, I think, came from a really fascinating insight, which was that um, many organisations who find themselves in the sort of privileged position to be able to add a digital resource into their organisation do so in sort of compartmentalized transformation or, or digital issues with that person and the CEO can then go off and do their thing essentially. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens in that process is that yes, the organization benefits from the resource, but the CEO themselves doesn't necessarily get too invested in it. And therefore the kind of learnings from that program mm -hmm. are not kind of driven up. And so the, the program designed with the Australia Council and run by uh, with ACME um, in, in Melbourne was, uh, I think, was it 30 CEOs over two years, yes. I think, in total? 30 or, or CEOs from small, medium and large organisations and 30 mentors who, who worked with them over very intense periods to sort of appraise them, I guess, of, of, of uh, industry-wide issues uh, around digital, but also very specifically within the organisation themselves. Um, so hopefully okay. we now have 30 more skilled CEOs yeah. in, the, in in industry who are more cognizant of some of the, the kind of issues and opportunities that, that um, arise through digital. And hopefully they themselves can, um, you know, pass that on essentially, not just talk amongst themselves, but pass that on yeah. within their own organizations and on teams. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. It comes back to this thing with digital and digital accessibility. Um, it can often just become really siloed and become one person's job. And when that person leaves the organization, all of the knowledge leaves with them. And so we're trying to create ways of embedding it more fully so that everybody has a stake because I think the work is better when everybody has a stake. No, I mean, yeah, totally. I'm just thinking, oh yeah, you know, as someone who's director of audience engagement and yeah. 61 years old, I know that it's a real challenge for me you know, psychologically to think I don't, you know, I don't know what, I've never been on TikTok or I've never, you know, it's yeah. like what's, you get feel left behind. And so I think people of all ages and all levels, it's like, how do we spread learning? How do mm. we understand that together? And it benefits the audience and the whole organisation as well. And I think we're cognizant that, that wherever wherever we stand today in relation to this idea of digital, in five or 10 years time, it'll be completely different. And, and I think all of us in terms of the endeavors that, that we're involved in will be, will regard a success when the word digital is essentially removed from the discourse, that it's just part of our work and part of our practice. Um, and so there is a little bit of that of saying that um, when we look across the, mm. uh, the, the skills and capacity in the sector is extremely broad. It's a very, very um, broad continuum. But if we were able to 
introduce digital, or not even introduce, sorry, I should get out of that headspace, but to further digital in such a way that even talking about it sort of becomes redundant because it's part yeah. and parcel of what we do. Yeah. I think that's sort of happened in marketing, right? It's sort of happened insofar as we used to talk about this idea of digital marketing, but essentially that's now just marketing. And yes. that, that word digital mm. has been deprecated out of, out of language in, in, in that particular area. Yeah. And I think across our work, yeah. then hopefully the same might be true before long. I would, I would say that. Like, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. So. I was just going to say, before we can get there, we have to have a moment where every organization like looks at it and is like, okay, well, like my HR system runs on a digital platform. My pay system runs on this. My website does. And just see it fully and holistically <coughs> for what it is that every part of the way that you operate, your email, all of your meetings are all interacting with technology. And once you... Once you can, I think, get to a point where you existentially understand that your every organization is inherently a digital organization, then we can get to the phrase where no organization is a digital organization. Um, but it is, it is a real, it's a sector-wide learning. It's, it's hard for people to get around it. Yeah, yeah, totally. I was about to say, just to um, inquire for yourself what digital is in the organization because we throw the word around you know direct to leadership level it's like digital this i mean are we talking website are we what are we talking about when we say the digital platform or the digital realm or the digital mm -hmm. mark you know and how to make that redundant if you don't and if you're not all really clear what you're talking about in the first place so i think yeah it's like an interesting point brilliant thank you thank you sophie that's your questions done for now <laughs> Right, now it's Marcus. So Marcus, could we both work here at this mm -hmm. wonderful place? Um, uh, I think if you could share a little bit about what we do here, um, what we already do in the space, and um, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe if you could talk a bit about online and virtual offerings that we did during COVID. Yeah, okay. Well, like um, so we offer a lot of... Um, digital content um, in the form of a website, mca.com, and then we also have mca.art, which sort of showcases what kind of works and everything we have on in the exhibitions and everything surrounded that and all the content surrounded that. So audio description and Auslan. Um, and then, yeah, the website also has that sort of stuff as well. But I mean, during lockdown and COVID and all of that, we had a show on called uh, the Richard Bell, You Can Go Now show. And we kind of got very lucky with that as uh, Richard Bell has his, his Aboriginal embassy work that is, has been ongoing for a while. But um, we sort of developed a microsite and sort of took his work digital as well. And we had the digital Aboriginal embassy. Um, and that show opened, I think, a week before the big 2021, <laughs> two years ago, two years ago lockdown. Mm. Wow. And... Um, there was an interactive sort of um, element to that work where Richard Bell would ask an answer about, you know, yeah. the Aboriginal embassy or, or, or a First Nations um, relevant topic. And the user could respond with text or sound or audio or a video. Um, and we kind of got very lucky that that happened, that digital sort of platform happened around that big lockdown time um, because users were really interacting with it. And we had over... I think it was something like 400 or 500, um, you know, what are they called? When someone sharing, well, enter, thingy. We had a, we had Sorry. 500 thingies. And, um, <laughs> digital thingy. Digital thingy. Um, responses, that's the word. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really wish we could have seen it, seen if the lockdown didn't happen, what, what that, what this, you know, yeah. how many responses we would have got yeah. just because of that. Um, but we went, we went full digital with that, with that exhibition. Um, all of the panel talks were all Zoom recorded and um, captioned and put online in that way so people could watch from home. Um, yeah, everything just sort of went straight to digital and it was a, it was a, a, a testing time, you know, we were testing a lot of things. We were we had six or seven laptops with people calling in from just around the office, you know, to see if we could handle mm. six, seven panelists talking and then put it into one Zoom. And how do we how do we work with that with the software mm. that we have? And and um, That's right. you know how do we how do we share these experiences with people at home and these panels that we can 
now thankfully do now, um, even though there are um, people from home, you, you know, um, watching as well. But mm. yeah, how could we take all of this and yeah. make it completely digital was one of the big questions yeah. that we had. I mean, just, you know, you'd think the MCA would be fully equipped with all the latest technology, but you know, we're a not-for-profit organization. So when COVID hit, we realized that most staff have um, computer screens without cameras. Mm. Yeah. So we couldn't do Zoom. They couldn't do Zoom. It's like this sort of like this, uh, you know, what? <laughs> we yeah, kind of like we can't reach people. So we had to invest in that just as an organization. Yeah. And yeah. even now we there's certainly it's not everybody for sure. So no, it's exactly. just interesting. But I think one of the like many people across many museums and galleries across the world, we've really learned that a hybrid event is the way forward mm -hmm. and a really accessible way to reach across remote and regional Australia. And so many of our programs working with, like, with people with dementia yep. and their care partners, we run an online version and you would think that wouldn't work, but it really does. Mm -hmm. um, it's about a shorter time span, yep. but it's really just, yeah. you know, and, people and, from and, all over. And Jirali as well, um, our, you know, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander programs yep. that we do that go out to people's, you know, regional classrooms all yeah. across New South Wales. Um, again, you, you'd go, oh, how does that work but it does it really you know we have multiple yeah. kids and multiple classrooms calling in from yeah yeah all around yeah it's all about the connection because i always used to think Girali was about bringing in young people from all uh, you know from remote areas into the mca and having the experience here across four days now we still do that but the connection and the quality of that connection mm. still exists online because it's also what young people are really used to. Mm. I do think it's an interesting point around the real and the, yeah, yep. the screen. I mean, we're all in that kind of conversation, but not now. <laughs> Later on. Anyway, we, we, we are also constantly learning. We've just recently, uh, I think we've still got a few to be put up, but we're almost ready to have access hubs, mm -hmm. particularly on our website, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, our website's a clung, you know, big beast because we do a lot of stuff. So it's like, how can people find it easily? Yeah. What the information they need in terms yeah. of accessibility? So, you know, it's like no one is certainly perfect and we're always learning. I yeah. would say that. It's, <laughs> it's, it's always a reflective process. Yeah. You know, the more that you, you yeah. go, you have to keep thinking about newer ways and easier ways to have yeah. it accessible for people. Yeah, mm. I think I'm working with experts like Accessible Arts and mm -hmm. Aspects, you know, Autism Australia, yep. etc. All right, Marcus, another question. Go Your passion it. is storytelling. So how do you think we can weave storytelling better into digital mediums <clears throat> to ensure people aren't left out when watching at home? This is a great question. And I was so, oh, this is, this is such a good question that I was even sending it to some of my team members before saying like, how would you answer this in 50 words or less? <laughs> <laughs> and then it kind of became more confusing. <laughs> they, you know, their responses were, oh, how do we situate ourselves, you know, as who we are and where we are and how do we share that with people? Um, you know, and, and I think it comes down to just having that capacity and having that resource and that drive to be able to capture stories and moments and um, exhibitions and, and, and uh, programs and be able to share it. Um, so I think having, you know, digital producers and, and the, uh, cameramen, weirdly enough, and, you know, to, to be able to capture these moments and photographers, um, we do this thing here at the MCA called a visual story where we will sort of describe first off on the website not only how to get here but what to expect when you're here and um and that sort of shows you know um mm. we're sort of already <laughs> dictating the story mm. um say if you're coming for a program there will be a visual story how to get to that program how what to expect what the lights will be like if it's you know quite mm. um overstimulating or not so i think capturing stories having the capacity to tell stories and then also keeping up expectations mm. um is is one of the ways i guess yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i think a visual, visual story acts as you know it's that universal design idea in that it was set up to support people mm -hmm. and their access requirements but tons of people use visual stories to find their way to the intimidating, intimidating, in, you know, the scary place yeah, exactly. that is the MCA, yeah. you know, and like, how do you get into it? 
Mm. You know, where's the door? Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, final question, Marcus. In your digital realm, how do you think businesses and arts organisations can continue to adapt and grow accessibility in digital content? Well, I guess it's just, yeah, it's, it's feedback and it's talking to these institutions, accessibility, accessibility arts and OSCO and, yeah. and looking around at, you know, what other people at your level doing as well and, and getting a real feel for it. And then having those conversations with, you know, um, uh, blind or hard of hearing communities, uh, blind and, heart and deaf communities mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff and getting those feedbacks. Um, looking at your website, um, reflecting and doing all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's also having, I guess, being able to also not to get too money, but also having a, a budget for that sort of stuff too. Um, moving forward, this sort of thing is going to this, these, um, this sort of content. So Auslan content or audio description content, um, it, it, it should support an exhibition or support what you're doing. So I think having a budget there and having the resources and the capacity and putting in a workflow and talking to everybody and and working with other teams and I think that's the way forward. I think that's the best way for businesses to sort of start mm -hmm. to adapt accessibility in digital. Yeah. I think yeah. I could be wrong. <laughs> but um yeah. Okay. Thank you. I guess. Yeah, sounds right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Marcus. That's great. Thank you very much. Right, Stuart. Last but not least, it's Stuart. <laughs> so when we went into COVID, that was a massive learning curve for us all, as we've said. So at the Opera House, what digital transformations were not embedded into your plan? And how did you adapt? It's a good question, because I think the Opera House was in a very privileged position at the end of March 2020, mm. insofar as, I mean, it's in a very privileged position in general in terms of the amount of resources and, and, and funding and space and um, status and, and, and all the rest of it. So going into COVID, um, even though the organisation had to understand and adapt to what it, what it meant for transforming a live performance into effectively a digital performance, um, the tools that we needed, even though we might not have identified them immediately, the tools became available to us. Mm. You know? um, and I think early on, we sort of understood that we are in this privileged position of being able to run a program through COVID um, when other organisations can't. So let's work as best we can with the sector to bring artists into a COVID safe environment and, and run, a, run a live stream program there. Um, so in terms of that kind of what, what didn't we do in terms of digital transformation, I feel like it was, it was, you know, we all experienced time in such a strange way during that time, but it was very fast. It was very um, iterative. The things we did one week, we might not necessarily do the next week. And so on. we were constantly shifting and we were learning and changing our approach as we went. And actually, when you look at the things we would maybe do in like the second lockdown in 2021, very different to what we did in 2020. It's a much mm. more measured and, and I wouldn't say considered, the first one was considered, but it was just throwing everything at the wall mm, and seeing what mm. sticks, whereas second time around we had, you know, a lot more reflection to run off. So I feel like in terms of transformation, we, we went through it in fits and starts, but, but feel quite um, happy with where it, it landed as far as the capacity and resourcing and strategy within the house. Where it didn't kind of land or where today it still has not landed is, I think, more broadly uh, within. I'm going to talk about the performing arts sector here because it's very specific to performing arts. Well, it's specific to my experience in performing arts. It may be within visual arts. There's a lot of uh, similarity. Um, but the, the complex issue of rights management mm. for live performance is extraordinary. Um, mm. And be, there is no... There's no um, there's essentially very little in the way of guidelines for, for, the, for the industry, not just in Australia, but, but internationally as well. So being able to determine, I want to uh, film or live stream this show, what, is, you know, what do I need to consider from a legal perspective, from a financial perspective, from a production perspective? Um, and that will change on a show-by-show, artist-by-artist basis, because there is no kind of one way to do things, if you like. Um, 
and that can be really um, that can be really challenging. So I, I would I've, I've started to sort of um, <coughs> calculate the number of requests that we would you know so the house puts on the seven venues at the house and it operates 364 days a year. So there's a lot of shows that tumble mm -hmm. through the house. But for every um, every time we request to to film a show. Um, I would say probably about 80% of requests or 85% of requests we put out there um, are declined. Mm -hmm. So it isn't the case of us just being able to say, yes, we have the resources to film something. There's a very complex process of, of approval and licensing in order to get to the point where you can, turn the, you can turn the cameras on. And each case is actually very different. I'd love to be able to say the reason people don't say yes is because X, Y, and Z. But actually that rationale is, is pretty... Um, mm. it's, as I say, pretty different on a case by case basis. So, trying you know for the, for, the in, for the industry to get a sense of well, is there a kind of quasi true north through this that everybody can sort of gather around to say if we're going to film a show, here's the here's the kind of legal framework in which we might do it, who gets paid, and how much do they get paid, and so on and so on. Um, but in the absence of that, it's it's still very it's still very ad hoc and therefore very challenging. That's fascinating. I hadn't I I didn't know I didn't sort of get that because work in yeah. visual yeah. world, so that yeah. all the programmes we did online were, you know, audience engagement programmes, yeah. delivering to a community, yeah. not, not yeah. art as such. You know? Well, let's see, I mean, oh, let's give you some concrete examples. If you take something like musical theatre, which is probably the most fraught of them all, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, every single song in, let's say it's 12 songs, in a, in a, in a one-hour show. Every single song might be written by a different person, might be, be a different publisher and so on. And each individual song needs to be cleared with the publisher. Now, if it's, if it's a Sondheim musical, then you're clearing everything with the estate. But if it's a cabaret show with 12 different songs by 12 different publishers, there's a lot of effort in having to clear those for live stream and broadcast and also cost. Yeah. You know, and it generally works on a favoured nation basis. So the one time, so someone will say, yes, you can have that for $200. The next person says it's 1000 Suddenly everybody needs to be paid 1000 yeah. mm -hmm. You know, So we've just gone through the process of clearing some works for a show we're doing in the forecourt next week, which is musical theatre. It's probably one of the most extensive and fraught and expensive processes. <laughs> um, and I'd love for that to obviously not be the case, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's um, because of that lack of... of, of standards, if you like, in yeah. terms of saying, if you want to do X, then it costs Y, you know, not dissimilar, let's say, to something like um, APRA. So if you if you were trying to, to sort of license something through APRA, it's very clear in terms of if it's this number of streams, you know, you, you pay this amount of fee for this amount of time, and it's great. So you'd, in advance of something, you could say, I want to stream this, and if I use an APRA, you know, kind of process, I could work out how much that'll cost. But that's not the case. You're having to make those requests each and every time. Um, and so in terms of access, mm. I actually think that's probably one of the number one barriers yeah. is the fact that we literally cannot film the things that we want to film yeah. because of this very protracted, mm. complex and, and expensive process. Mm. Wow. <laughs> it's, <laughs> <a downer answer. laughs> it's reality, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Could see like it would take such an effort, so much easier to go. Let's not do it, but it's also right. the implications of not doing it. You know, Correct. everyone has to come to. Yeah. You know, anyway. Yeah. We keep asking, and you know, we keep getting doors closed in our face. Yeah. But we keep asking. Yeah. You know. Okay. Thank you. All right. So next question: What do you do to ensure representation within the digital series? What do you have in place in terms of online access as well as captioning, mm. for example? Well. This kind of slightly follows that, that okay. last um, question because um, in, in everything I just described, we're then kind of in this curious position of only being able to build a program out of the folks who acquiesce and say yes, you know, and that isn't necessarily representative of the program. That's just representative of the people who said yes. And so as a kind of corollary to that, I think what we've done over the last couple of years is we've, is we've, we've, we've looked at the money that we've been investing in in the recording of live performances, and essentially almost kind of carved off half of that to invest in original digital um, productions or, or digital films, 
performance films or work that is digital in nature, digitalist practice essentially, knowing that in order for us to, to create a better representative balance of the type of work that is being made and, people are, uh, and the work that people are interested in, is that we need to go out and commission that work ourselves and kind of like exactly what we've been saying here, starting from, you know, we want to commission the work from you and within that, here is what we expect in terms of, you know, the rights and in terms of accessibility and so on. So we can start from, from that without having to go through that other process. So we now have a program that's essentially split in two. Um, one which is very much about still recording live performances, but now commissioning original digital work. And that's been such a blessing because it gives us so much flexibility to, to essentially go anywhere and work with artists who otherwise might not be able to be represented at the at mm. Opera House. You know, In order for you to take to the stage at the Opera House, if you're trying to do it yourself, it's a very expensive exercise. But you know, um, for that to be a... Um, uh, for that exercise to be fruitful and fulfilling, there's a certain number of tickets you'll need to sell in order to make that mm. experience worthwhile, even though it would be subsidised to, uh, to a certain extent. So there's a whole, obviously, in, in a continuum, there's a whole kind of um, massive cohort of artists who are outside of that paradigm. And so what this, the, the digital or the screen programme, as we refer to it as, um, what that allows us to do is work with those artists. And potentially, yes, they may you know, graduate, if that's the right word, into doing a show at the house, or they may not, because that's not the kind of practice they do. It's screen-based work or digital-based work. Um, and so that's the, that program is, is, is growing and growing, and the, um, one of the kind of next fruits of that will be a, um, uh, a season um, purely of, of digital performance work um, in a few months' time. Great. Mm. Cool. <laughs> Fantastic articulate panellists there. Do we just... Um, Give them all a round of applause before we look at questions from everyone. Okay, we're so on time, I think. Yeah. So let's do um, a Q&A with some of you here in real life, and then I'll look at questions that have appeared on the screen. How's that sound? Well, we'll see if anyone wants to ask a question first. We put your hand up, and Mike will come. Don't be shy. Thank you. Um, my question's actually to you, because you mentioned Access Hubs. Yes. And I would like to know what that is. Yes. Yeah. It's just a fancy term for pages on our website, which, del which are um, dedicated to specific access requirements. So there'll be one for uh, deaf, hard of hearing, one for autism, um, Marcus. Audio description. Yes, um, thank you. Dementia. And one more. Uh, Bella. Uh, Bella program. Yeah. yeah, Bella is our Which, name for our suite of programs for those uh, with um, disability, for children and mm -hmm. adults. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got a, a. They're all ready to go up. We're just waiting on th things, a few up, but we're just nearly there. They're all up. Susanna Thorne, my access manager, is going there. Over there. Uh, these things have taken a long time, it, you know, yeah, because of the scale we're at, and yeah, how well, yeah, <laughs> all the consultation we've had mm -hmm. to do, and yeah, but um, yeah. So just well done, and thank you for the question. Sorry, I wasn't clear. Okay, hi. Hi. Um, early uh, in in the chat, we covered. Um, uh, two things back to back that I was really interested in. In reviewing uh, your current uh, digital offerings, uh, your website or wh whatever you have, and um, also Stuart mentioned your old work and going back onto it, it's good to have um, everybody in your team getting involved and, and, and looking at things like alt text. And They are special skills though, and how do you... Uh, is, there, is there a good way of ensuring that when you do a review of your uh, current digital um, customer facing stuff that it is getting reviewed in the right way yeah. for the right, um, the right areas you want to cover? Yeah. Uh, great question. I can do no like yeah. So ideally you would work with somebody like Accessible Arts or your state based body. Uh, because they are art specialists, so they have an understanding of the sector, and also they are up to date with accessibility guidelines. 
I think that if you do that once and you get a sense of where the standards are, you could probably do that every second year. And then on the off year, you could get everybody in a room with the formats that have been set out in your kind of accessibility review from the year before and do a health check. I mean, ideally, you'd want to do that twice a year. Um, I think sometimes what we can do is we can get an accessibility review and then be like, sick, <laughs> <laughs> done. Um, and that, and I, and that comes back to this thing where then it just sits with one person, it sits in one document, it is not embedded. Um, and I, I, there is a real joy in getting people together and being like, what tools are you using? Um, Studio A, who went to our digital strategies in residence program, they do a thing where every time they have a team meeting, they have somebody come and show a fun new digital tool that they're using in their practice. And it's just rotating between the staff and the artist educators throughout their team this little section, they make a little video, this is a fun tool that we can use for X. And that's also like another really great way of like continuing that conversation, making sure that no, no one person is holding all that work. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just quickly add to that. Um, is that me? Um, I think alt text, we've, we've gone down a journey of looking at alt text for a number of our images online in the collection, and there's so many of them. So we need to train up uh, some of our willing hosts who look, you know, who are our casual team, who look after the artworks downstairs, who a lot of them are artists. Um, so but it, that takes so much work and we have, we, and the cost, and it's like, how do we do it and make sure that it's being done well? Because actually doing alt text is really difficult. Writing simply about complex, artworks is really difficult and the decisions you have to make around what words you're choosing but I would I really want to say that it's so much better to try to do it to step into that space because it's quite easy to not do that but it is so much better <laughs> particularly for an organization like the MCA it's like we have to take this on and then what does it look like for us to take that on and just not beat ourselves up if we're not getting it right all the time. But I think that the move forward is the thing. You agree? Yeah. You approach it with humility. And when people come with feedback, you act in it. I think that it, it becomes more rewarding. And then you connect with the people who have the feedback. And then that mm -hmm. becomes a really lovely process as well. Yeah. Okay. I might just look at my screen now and um, ask a question, a couple of questions from that. All right, so thank you. Go on here. So how do we ensure organizations give money and time to building accessibility? Uh, for example, production budgets for artists. Good question. <laughs> how do we ensure organizations give money and time to building accessibility? Well, I would say off the top of my head, it's about uh, making it priority and uh, discussing it as a priority <laughs> and having it at a director and leadership level, wouldn't you say that? Mm -hmm. yeah. have, have a line in your budget. And when you apply for a grant, a lot of grants require it um, and put in an appropriate amount of money to do it well at that point. Um, get the quotes when you write the grant yeah. so that you're not under quoting and then running out later. Um, I can't speak fully to my colleagues in, in the production team because I'm, I'm not embedded there, but I, but I do know that um, part of the process now when um, going through technical requirements and rider requirements, um, you know, that, that, that the accessibility requirements, yes, they're, they're um, enshrined, but they've been developed um, a lot further now. So when, um, when artists are being contracted, you know, um, all of their particular needs and requirements are there from, from, from get-go, um, mm. as opposed to that as being something that's introduced later in the process. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I would say, um, I won't move on to this now because I think this isn't working, uh, tech. It's because I've got oh, wow. hearing aids and glasses <laughs> and this on, so there's, there's this kind of like, I feel a bit robotic with all this head stuff. Um, yeah, I would, I would say one of the one of the things that helps is to employ people who have a disability. You know, and I came here 
uh, being hard of hearing and understanding that, um, yeah, to make space for difference, disability in all kinds of ways, and what would that look like? And in my position as director, to have the power and authority to make those decisions, I think is was really key, and to employ uh, artist educators who identify as deaf has been a joy. And we have two of them here, and I can't tell you what a difference it makes to have them as part of our team. <laughs> I don't know if you want to say anything at that point, but you know, <laughs> thank you. No, we'll put you on a spot. <laughs> okay, um, I'll look for another question. Uh, what else have we got? Any tips for cost-effective ways to reach accessibility goals for small orgs working within existing budgets that haven't accounted for accessible tech? Perhaps we covered that at the beginning when you had your quick and dirty, yeah. easy ways. Mm -hmm. um, oh, the other thing is if you upload something to YouTube, uh, you can get it captioned and then you can download the captions and check them yourself. That is, uh, mm -hmm. it is not the best, but it is a way that you can shortcut it and then go back and do that work of correction yeah. in-house. Mm -hmm. There's a question, if, sorry, I was just having quite a sticky beak on the <laughs> side of there. <laughs> well, let's ask that question. Um, there's a question there about how um, AI might be incorporated into, mm -hmm. um, into um, accessibility, That's which is a great question, yeah. as we're sitting here talking about digital tech. And actually that comes through captioning as well. So what AI I think has done um, for captioning, um, and so similar, pro I mean, uh, something like Adobe Premiere Pro, for example, captions in a similar way to YouTube, but certainly AI can help in captioning. But like, you know, I, I think the best way to embrace AI is with that human agency, to take what is what is developed through that and to have that um, uh, sort of layer of human review yeah. um, before proceeding. So, um, you know, one of my colleagues is, is in the audience today. Um, and, you know, we work um, uh, across talks festivals where we might live stream 10 talks in one day with four or five, six speakers all with, um, you know, very different, um, you know, name spelling and pronunciation and so on. And, and AI generated captioning is generally pretty terrible um, when trying to, um, when trying, when using people's uh, names. Um, and so that requires that kind of layer of, of human review and intervention to be able to ensure particularly that people are represented correctly. Um, but I think, you know, a AI offers us um, so many great things, but, it, but having that, um, human agency is really critical to mm -hmm. use it to, to its best advantage. Um, I don't know of any other AI-specific accessible tech. Have you come across anything? Um, I have started using, well, I'm, I'm looking into and going to start using AI to audio describe works. Yeah. Um, so, um, or not to, not to fully audio describe works, but to, to help. Yeah. Um, to help create scripts and, and create the voice as well. If, yeah. if, if um, we have, we have, um, two very hardworking artist educators in here in at that work here that um, help record with audio description um, and uh, it's just a ne and the next way to have them also help yeah. um, say if they can't make it to a recording or something we might be able to use AI to create their voice. So how does that work? That sounds fascinating. So that they have to they have to approve it they have yeah. to s s like open wordly open wordly say on a recording that I this is my voice and I agree to this yeah and then the AI will need 15 minutes of, uh, roughly 15 minutes of them just talking. Yeah. And then the AI, you can type in whatever you want and then the AI will create their voice and generate their voice and have right. them say whatever they want, which is amazing and crazy and wild um, and scary a little bit, but yeah. um, it's very interesting yeah. what it can do. Can you also do like a first run of alt text. So I would, I would check it just like with the other mm -hmm. things that are, um, yeah, I think AI is great to do a first run of things. Uh, it can help you write an accessibility checklist and it can do a very basic mm -hmm. accessibility order of your website. It doesn't replace humans, but it's not a bad way to start the conversation yeah. internally. It's, it's a tool. It, it's, yeah. it's, you know, um, it can, AI can describe images now. Mm -hmm. you know, what's in an image? So yeah. it's going to be an exciting moving I forward. I think it's a... Uh, AI is like, who knows what 
the next few months will look like so fast. Mm -hmm. So this is like in a year's time. That's an accessible tech AI panel discussion, don't you mm. think? Or maybe even this year. Who knows? Yeah. So it seems that's really going to pace. Yeah. And I, I'm currently, I'm not, I haven't started using it yet. I'm almost going to feel guilty about doing it because it's like going to replace my head. <laughs> or my thinking in some way yeah. but I'm just kind of I'm not one of those initiator yeah. people mm -hmm. I'm a kind of follower I'm, I might come to regret it when Skynet takes over but I'm, I'm very much an advocate for AI and I'm very yeah. much an advocate for a starting Good. position of positivity and by all means be sceptical and by all means understand um, what it is you're doing and how it's being used and what the what the data set is and the, the yeah. le legality of the data sets that you're using by all means be cognizant of all that but but to uh to embrace and work with, you know, yeah. because it's um, it's such a great, powerful tool if it's wielded yeah. um, for the right purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, on that note, we'll we'll finish. I've just got a few thank yous, so bear with me. But yeah, I think just to say that you know, it is a tool, isn't it? All these things are the tools, yeah. and it's how we use them. Yeah. If yeah. I just there's, there's just a couple of quick ones that I that I saw um, last week from the from the UK some research being done into accessible tech that I thought I'd just very briefly quickly mention oh. one of which I thought was um, terrific which is using augmented reality whereby the um, the uh, Auslan interpreter is is essentially uh, brought up on your phone using augmented reality so you could be watching something on screen and the interpreter is there essentially through, through your phone um, interpreting and they're shot against green screen somewhere. So you're, you're seeing them in kind of in a 3D representation, which I thought was great. Mm -hmm. It's just a sort of dummy. And then similarly, a, a very similar one whereby um, the Auslan interpreter um, was not standing in real life adjacent to us. It was actually a hologram uh, on the stage. And this was in a theatre production in, in, in the UK that they had done that with. And again, just sort of experimenting with that. But I like those ideas. And I, I just want to very quickly mention uh, one, one of the films that um, Liz from Accessible Arts um, um, shared with me last year where the Auslan interpretation was done with the same creative let's say, dress and costuming and appearance as the performers in the film themselves. And it became very much part of the aesthetic of the film. But I feel like that is such a terrific um, representation and a kind of way forward for thinking about incorporating that. I've seen a couple of great films out of the UK that does similar things. Um, and that was a real eye opener. And, I, and um, I'm really excited about how we might take that on board. Mm. Yeah, we see that with um, audio description as well, rather than that very formal start at the left hand corner or right hand corner mm. and go around it's more around feeling and mm. meaning that mm. you as an audio descriptor start to bring yourself into it so it's this thing about you start to embody yeah. part of it you're not yeah. this objective person and embrace that and put it so the much we could talk about but it's time to finish and so thank you to you the audience for joining in person and online hope you've enjoyed it uh, those of you here we're in, i'm encouraging you to go up to the cafe please be aware it's a public cafe but um uh is to continue the conversation if you wish to. Uh, the next um, Accessible Arts uh, event, um, hybrid event, is the 29th of June, uh, Art Gallery, New South Wales, and it's called The Future of Art. Maybe that's got AI in it. <laughs> Who knows? Almost so. Right, and now a massive thank you to our sponsors and partners. Thank you to Create New South Wales. And this event was made possible with support from City of Sydney. Thank you to Pyrrhus for making this event as accessible as possible. I think they've been amazing, wonderful to work with. Thanks again to you three. I've just so enjoyed that conversation and it seems to have gone really quickly. Um, and I'd like to say a thank you to all MCA staff behind the scenes, Susanna, Cindy and Christian, um, and all the, um, yeah, all the wonderful tech people here. And finally, thanks to Accessible Arts for being such an amazing partner, uh, enabling this to happen. And uh, my personal thanks to Robin, who's been amazing writing all these questions, doing all my thinking. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.